Okay. Good morning and welcome to Sunday Story Hour, where we share real life stories of how human design has helped people tell a richer, more true story of who they really are. Today's guest is Robin Wynn, who is a best selling author of multiple books, and um, she is also a 6 2 emotional generator. So I'm very excited to hear Robin's story, and I know you guys will be too. So, um, Robin, if you want to start, I will do a couple technical things I need to do while you tell us a little bit about um, how you, if you're okay with that. I should, I guess I should ask you a sacral question, right? Would you like to share your story right away? Sure, I'm happy to. Thank you, Kathy, so much. I'm I'm thrilled to be here with you all. Yeah. So as Kathy said, I'm a 6-2 emotional generator. I was first introduced to human design in 2006. Um, a colleague of mine uh, introduced us. I was in a teacher training for the diamond work, diamond logos. And a, a colleague of mine uh, introduced us. It actually took me a year before I went to have a session with her. And honestly, it was fairly overwhelming. Um, there was so much information and yet there were two pieces of information that three pieces of information that made a huge difference and shifted right there, the trajectory of my life. So I, I really appreciate that it doesn't take a lot of human design information to have a big impact. So the fact that I was a generator and had to follow my yes, no's, that was big. I mean, the simplest things are really sometimes the most impactful and the, sec the second thing was that my wife was a projector, and that dramatically shifted how we saw each other, understanding that dynamic. I, I write about this in my books, but we had done, you know, I was a therapist. We had both been in therapy, done a lot of therapy, a lot of couples therapy. We had really great communication skills. But that piece of her thinking I was a workaholic and me thinking she was a little bit lazy you know, um, was a mm. place we butted up against on, on pretty much a daily basis because I wake up in the morning, my motor's running, I'm ready to go. She wakes up in the morning, she's like a cat, she wants to hang out, she needs, <laughs> you know, very slow entry into the world and was just really dramatically different styles that we didn't understand. And we, because we didn't understand, we judged each other. I'm laughing because my husband's a manifesting generator and I'm a projector and that I'm the cat. <laughs> yeah. So, so that really, um, that was the beginning of appreciating difference in a new light. I mean, I would, I, I was seeped uh, in the, in the Enneagram. I, I loved systems. I, you know, I was interested in astrology. I, I, I was interested in all of that, but this somehow shifted everything took it out of a a judgmental place took it out of a hierarchical place and kind of leveled the playing field and activated curiosity mm. so that th those two things and then the third thing was that I was my authority was emotional and that I wasn't designed to make decisions in the moment and I had a habit of making decisions in the moment and I had a habit of being very vulnerable to sales and you know with, I, I just with that open head, I would get so excited. Mm. Someone would bring something into the field. I would be so excited, like, yes, let's do it. And then, wow, you know, then afterward, I'd be like, why did I do that? You know, and I didn't trust my decision making from that place of not understanding. So it was an understanding, a relational understanding and a understanding of myself that really it was a big impact. It was a big, it was like a rubber hits the road kind of impact. At that time, there weren't all the places you could go and run a free chart. And, you know, that wasn't happening quite yet. It was a very elaborate system. Um, yeah. So I didn't have access. What year was this around? Again? That was 2004. Okay. That's what I thought. Yeah. So I didn't have access to bring it into my life. Honestly, it felt pretty far out there. It felt pretty, I was a woo person, but it felt woo, 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 woo. Um, and I didn't feel like I had access to, to use it or it just, it didn't seem very readily available to me. 
Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, yeah, that um, there's been a huge shift even just since I found it or it found me seven years ago. And so you're talking almost 20 years ago. That's a huge difference on just what was available in general. Right. But yeah. you were speaking of a woo person. I would love for you to um, share a little bit of your woo history that you'd had because I think your your journey is just fascinating. So just if you wouldn't mind briefly telling people some of the woo things you have done before human design. Oh, let's see. Hmm. Let's see where I would start with that. I have to go digging in the treasure trove to uh <laughs> you always been a woo person? Pull that think? up. Well like even as like a teenager or you know, I have the sun is in gate three. Mm -hmm. So that's innovation. So right. yes, I have always been outside the box, you know, call that woo or not woo. Yes. I've always been outside the box. I, you know, I was always grappling with the question of God and, you know, as a kid, I was sure I was going to go to hell because I was a terrible person. Um, and then when I was in sixth grade, I kind of, I started studying the Greek gods and goddesses. And I thought, wow, this is made up. This whole thing is made up. And I just like became an atheist. I just, and that shifted. That was a big shift for me. And then I, when I was in my early twenties, I got involved with, oh, well, yeah. When I was 19, I think I read, um, uh, autobiography of a yogi and as I was reading it my breath stopped I was practicing some of the breath breathing stuff he was talking about and my breath just stopped and I was like okay here we go I I was someone who was tapped in to the universe in a certain way um I had you know I don't know if you would people would call them out-of-body experiences I did I did have kind of a with my openness, one way I would describe it, with my openness, I had a permeability and a sensitivity that was in a dance with the universe at some level that I didn't have our articulation for. And then, uh, let's see, in my early, late, late teens, early 20s, I got involved with a, uh, with a group of women who were goddess goddesses <laughs> and doing, you know, I don't know if you've ever heard of Vicki Noble. She she created the first tarot deck, round tarot deck, feminist tarot deck. No. So, yeah. So this was a long time ago. <laughs> and uh, this was in the, the 80, late 80s, the early 80s, early 80s. Um, we were picking tarot cards and we were doing rituals and we were following the moon. And so, yeah, I was doing a lot of Wicca stuff in my early days. Um, I got involved I, you know, it's just been an unwinding story of spiritual teachers and teachings. And um, I'm thinking you're wanting something in specific, and I'm not sure I'm giving it to you about the story. Um, I guess, you know, I'm fascinated with the work of Byron Katie, and I know you ah. mentioned you have some history with Ram Das, And so all of that stuff yeah. to me was very yeah. like, wow, this person has definitely spent time finding herself before yeah. you and then you did this diamond logo work which I had never heard of so I'm sure people listening don't know so like my I guess what I'm looking for is you really did a lot of things that help would help you know who you were well here's um, the thing I was I was driven by pain mm. I was driven I was you know and I again I write about this in my books once I discovered human design oh I've got an open g oh my son is in gate three, difficulty at the beginning. Oh, I'm a 6'2 profile. Those first 30 years were a nightmare for me. Yes. So, you know, just deep suffering and feeling like I did not belong on this planet. And who was I and why was I here? And, you know, being wise beyond my years, as you know, like the six, I was like, I saw things people didn't see. I understood where what was happening. And I didn't understand why I was here, what I was here to do. I really thought I didn't belong on the planet. So there was a drive and it, the different ways I tried to feed that or, you know, make sense of myself in the world. First of all, early on, it was literature. I was, a, I, I read like crazy. So I, be, I got a degree in English literature. 
at UC Berkeley, you know, I was trying to understand the world and people. And then I did a lot of therapy just because it was like, I had to figure this out. I had to figure something out. I did, I became a body worker. I did something called Rosen Method Body Work that really looks at what's true in your story and what's like, we looked at the breath and when the breath came through, it was like you were speaking truth. And when you weren't, you would stay contracted. So I did a lot of Oh. body therapy work to kind of get to know myself and understand myself. And then uh, uh, I was, again, young, I met Amachi went the first time she do you know who Amachi is? She's I've the hugging saint. Her. Oh, She's I think I've heard of her. Saint. Yes. Yeah. So the first time she came to the US, I was in a living room with her. I always happen to get it with these teachers when before they become big, you know, so I was in a living room with her you know, she was amazing. She's just, she's an amazing being. So after, after Katie, I mean, after Alma, I met uh, Byron Katie. I heard about her while I was at a, a Indian dinner at Amachi's ashram. Someone said, oh, I've got Amachi and I've got Katie. I said, who is this Katie person? Because I go by frequency. I just resonate with frequency. Like, well, who, who is that person? Every, every cell in my body said, I needed to know this woman. So she was again very small. Not many people knew about her, um, and I started. My my wife and I started going to her um, center in Barstow, California. We were living in Berkeley. We'd drive down there almost every weekend and do workshops with her. And I started organizing for her. And then I did her first school. And then I became her right hand person for her schools. Traveled to Europe with her just immersed in working with her. And that was another big shift of like, oh my gosh, <laughs> how I've been seeing my lens. I mean, so much about this, you know, we started before we got on talking about the assemblage point. So much of my world had been seen through judging people and judging the world. Mm. And, you know, she used that judgment as a way to pierce through and find a different way of seeing and understanding the world coming to peace with the world so that was a big a big part of my shifting out of suffering really that was that was a big scrub from feeling like I don't belong here to of course I belong here I exist I belong here hello you know that was a story yeah. that was that was a story yeah so uh, I worked with Katie for a number of years and then I I again was introduced to Faisal Mukadam, who was a, yeah, he's the Diamond Logos. Okay. He, he and Hamid came over from Kuwait in the 80s and had an awakening, a psycho spiritual awakening, and understood that the, um, used the Enneagram and inquiry to, we talked about this earlier again, the shifting of the assemblage point from our egos and our, our, patterning like if you use the enneagram our 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 egoic patterning to our essential self to our being so i'm going to stop you because you yeah. and i have an interesting conversation that we had just started before we got on about the assemblage point and i had never heard of it until a couple of years ago when my sister um, barbara who is does a lot of energy work and lives in thailand introduced it to me um, and it's one of the things that she checks on people when she's doing a session. The first thing she muscle tests and asks, can I know where their assemblage point is seated? She has a chart that says, I think it's supposed to be like JK8, and I'm sure she'll correct me because it's probably not that, but something like that. JK, Let's say it's JK8 on this grid for a woman. And if it's there, then you're good. And if it's like there have been times like when my sister who actually passed a year, my other sister passed a year ago today, she, my sister could connect with her energy and she could sense her assemblage point dropping. Um, and so, but most, I've never heard anybody in human design talk about the assemblage point before and until I read your most recent book and you were talking about it. And so if you could just explain it a little bit as you understand it to people listening and where you were introduced to that whole concept, was it with yeah, Diamond so it was it was in the Diamond Logos work with Faisal and you know, I think words are tricky and I think different people may have different um, attributes to words. 
So I'm not sure that what your sister is doing is the same thing that I'm talking about, um, but it might be, I don't know. So the assemblage point, I mean, um, Carlos Castaneda talked yes. about the assemblage point, um, the way that it was introduced to me and that I'm working with it, I work with it, is that we are organized, most of us are organized, and this I could say goes all the way back to the body work, are organized around um, concepts. Where if you think about it in human design terms, we go to our head and look at the world through our heads. We make decisions through our heads, we're, or we are conditioned in our centers and our channels and our gates. We're conditioned and live out of conditioning. So we could say when you clear your conditioning, you're shifting your assemblage point. As you clear your conditioning, you shift your assemblage point. The way I, I see it and understand it is we're shifting from identifying with egoic patterns to identifying with our essential self, our true nature, who we, who we are, our beingness. That, that is the shift out of the egoic identification to the being identification. Okay. So that's how we can do it ourselves, right? Yeah. We do it as yeah. we as we unload, as we take the backpacks off, as we un, un untie the knots. You know, I had one spiritual right. teacher I worked with, uh, Leslie Temple Thurston, and she talked about the knot of Vishnu that was in the solar plexus. Like that's the the for her, that was the linchpin for you undo that knot and then the 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 energy can come up through the other chakras but you know however we do it that is the shift as long as we're living from an ego-based identity we are suffering right we are not in alignment with who we truly are we are living i the experience i had up you know for those first 30 years especially and then started shifting in later 30s when i met katie was uh, there's suffering. There's there's a war against the self. The ego is fear based. It's mm -hmm. essentially fear based. It's driven by fear. Our beings are not engaged in fear. Yes. That's it's not. That's not. Uh, there's no reality for fear in our true nature. Yeah. Well, you know, for people who aren't familiar with Byron Katie's and her and her the work, um, it's really a life-changing thing. And I felt like even just going through it one time, like I went through it one time with a particular person who always pushed my buttons, right? And it's when you do that last thing where you take away the fear of it happening again and you welcome it, right? Because, and I loved the fact that she tells you, um, so Byron Katie has this, for those who don't know, she has these questions you ask yourself and, um, about a situation that it has control over you, right? It has power over your emotion, your ego's fighting against it. And you ask these different questions. And when you start doing it, there's a natural thing to go, oh, I get it and not finish, right? To be like, oh, I get it. Now I get the point. You're going to, you know, whatever. And I love that she makes you like, she's like, no, you finish it. You've got to do all five. And, and it really was one of those things. And I have only done it twice on two different things. And now I feel like I can go straight to that whole, like, oh, all right, bring it on. Exactly. <laughs> you know? Right. This is something I'm here to learn this. Oh, this is making me uncomfortable. Oh, I'm growing. Mm -hmm. I'm learning. Right. And that's what human design has really given me the map to see where I'm growing and where I'm learning and where I'm taking in stuff that's not really me and and pushing back against it in fear or lack of worth. I think so much of it just comes down to not having enough self-love, right? And belief in our enoughness. Yeah, it's curious to me, because I just took a peek at your chart, you know, <laughs> it's curious to me that you talk about self-love and in value with your defined will center and to find g center how that um 
yeah, just the difference because both of those are open for me and they seem like, well, obvious places where there would be deficiency. So I guess I'm just curious for you. Well, I think what happens when you're defined in a place like, um, so I have a defined G, but it's defined only through the one eight. I have no other connection to my other, I have um, six defined centers, but only those two connect. So I have this feeling of my voice feels like I'm a self-projected projector in a lot of ways, right? So when people will um, not respond to something when I'm speaking from my heart, it's very um, easy to shut down. And I have told people, you know, a lot of people know I have this sleep apnea thing where I um, was told that I have an obstructed airway. And when I saw that little picture, they scanned and it had this, re she's like, it's like a straw. And I immediately was like, that's my one eight. That's my constricted voice. That's my shutting myself down because of the criticism of others. And when you have a defined will, and mine's super defined. I have, you know, the one channel, but I have all the gates defined. I don't have any open gates. And um, and then that's also another split. My will to the spleen is, uh, is you know, I'm a triple split. So only those two connect. And there's a lot of pushback from people because 70% of the planet has an open will. So they see my um, definedness right? As something that feels um, bossy, pushy, and there's more pushback, right? So as a projector with all the projector wounds, and then you add those two things on top of it, it really can make me feel like I'm constantly having to pull back because I'm too much. Does that make sense? So it so makes perfect love, sense. I love I myself still and be too much has taken me almost 60 years to do. I'll be 60 in November. And I think it's only been a year where I can really just say, I know who I am, who I came here to be, and I'm not for everyone and that's okay. Mm. So, yeah. That's, that's beautiful. So I wanna um go back to your story. So okay. you were saying how you were, um, how this really impacted your um, marriage. How long, how long had you been with your wife when you- uh, um, We'd been together since 81 and that was, so wow. we'd been together 15 years. And it still made that- 13 years, yeah. Oh yeah, huge. Yeah. And, it, and it's an ongoing, actually it's an, these are practices. I see the chart as a, as a engagement, not as, you know, a flat seat kind of thing. It's a living- a living dynamic. So right. I am constantly still learning about how to be with a projector and for her, how to, how to really hone and be, I mean, we ask each other the open-ended um, and yes, no questions, but it's an ongoing deepening understanding. And I just got something about her from you talking about your chart. Cause she's a triple split projector with the one eight and the, the 3955, I'm like, oh yeah, that's what I get that. I get what you're talking about. So yeah. and then do you bridge her splits? I bridge two, two of her splits. Okay. So that was also a big aha, uh -huh, like, oh, because she would get up every morning and go out for coffee. And I couldn't understand a coffee and a muffin. I thought she was wasting money going right. out. You can have that here, but she needed to do it. You know, and it was just like, once I got the triple split, like, oh, of course, go, go, go. You know, it was, it's not personal. Yeah. You need yeah. this. Yeah. Go. Yeah. That's huge. And now um, I also want to um, switch gears a little bit because you and I are both six lines. We're both six twos and we're both off the roof and we have been for a little bit now. And, you know, there's this big thing where the six line um, is always looking for their soulmate, but it's said that they often don't find them until after 50. And I've been with my husband. I, I was married really young to someone else when I was 19 for like, you know, that's part of my whole third line phase. Right. Um, and then, you know, sowed my wild oats after that. My husband and I got married um, when I was 32, I think something like that. Um, <laughs> But, and then, so we were on the roof this whole time and, I, you know, I love my husband. We've never 
you know, we've, we've had our ups and downs. I think anybody who says they haven't, hasn't had a, a real, you know, they're, they're avoiding things in my opinion. I shouldn't, you know, I don't know that for certain, but um, for me, this whole work that I've been doing now, because I didn't find human design until I was already off the roof. And so then this process of really finding who I am. And there was a, a point um, just a, maybe a year or two ago where I had to say a lot of things that I had to preface with, I love you, but I love me more. So da da da, da this is what I need to do. And I'm sorry if you, if you don't understand that, you know, um, and that has been a big shift in our marriage because it's, it's caused him to be completely different with me. And I believe we're much more, um, genuine and authentic. So although I don't have a different person, who's my soulmate, I think the soulmate process really didn't didn't hit where it needed to, like you couldn't really be authentic in a relationship until you're really authentic with yourself right and since we're not really in that role model phase till we come off the roof I think for me that's what's happened and I'm curious if you can speak to how that felt for you as a sixth line well again I feel like it's a an ongoing process I mean Yaro and I got together when I was 23 and we definitely you know, most people change relationships. <laughs> we just like reincarnated over and over again. We like, ah, shift the relationship, shift the relationship with the growth because there's so much growth, right? There's so much growth and relationships are such a great, you know, instigation of growth. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think what you're pointing to is really potent and powerful. And the the, it's like you a shoe that suddenly feels too small if you're not being authentic with yourself you have to work with that and so I definitely have experienced that in my relationship with Yaro a deepening authenticity with myself uh, even knowing human design it doesn't matter there's knowing human design is one thing living it is a whole nother thing actually living it being engaged with it and yeah, I I love what you're saying. I think that's exactly, you know, I, I still feel like it's had more, you know, there's more, more and more authenticity. It's again, part of that assemblage point for me, shifting from what are the egoic patterns I'm running that I don't even realize I'm running, mm -hmm. you know, and seeing them and then being honest about them. What's Yaro's profile? She's a 6'2". He is a six two also. Okay. My husband's a five one. So the poor man, I projected all my problems in my life have been his fault and he'll tell you. Right. <laughs> and he's still dealing. And I, I've had to, um, sh you know, incorporate when I'm responding to his responses, remembering how much I've projected on him. So he still has this conditioned response to mm -hmm. feel like everything is his fault. Plus he's a, he's a small split. So, um, and for people listening who don't know, a lot of times when someone has a small split, they view um, that as something that's wrong with them. And I bridge his small split with my 57 and my nine. I will connect him in two different places. So um, so whereas him bridging my splits makes me feel smothered and um, controlled, me bridging his splits makes him feel complete. <laughs> so it's very um, interesting to understand um, the dynamics and the responses. And um, it's been interesting to have to wait and not respond out of reactions. Like just yesterday, he was telling me how he thinks we need to both make, you know, he's speaking for both of us, which automatically I'm like this, right? I think we both need to make a point of getting out of the house and going for a walk or da da da. da and it felt so controlling, right? And I just, I was able to, to, say, think to myself, he wants me with him and I'm feeling controlled. And isn't it interesting that I still feel this way? And, um, and I love, and I think that's, you know, one of the other things I wanted to talk about that you call the witnessing observer. Mm -hmm. That's been a huge, a very helpful concept for me to, when I feel something to witness it, observe it 
and be able to see the energy mechanics of it and take away this personal emotional story of, you know, he's controlling me or rejecting, you know, whatever that story is that the mind makes up to explain the response in the body, right? And maybe can you speak a little bit to that witnessing observer idea? Yeah, well, it's, if we, again, it goes back to that assemblage point thing. We make conclusions in our childhood. We have traumas. They they happen. It's, we None of us escape that, right? Something happens that's not a fit, that's not a match, that doesn't align with us. We draw a conclusion. Something's wrong with us, usually. Something or something's wrong with them. But ultimately, there's a defic- a feeling of deficiency. We create a whole world, a whole we believe something and then we create a whole world. We look for that where we create patterns that create that. Those play out automatically like a tape until we bring in our awareness. When we shine the light of awareness on it, bring online our witnessing observer, then we can see just like you did with your husband. Oh, this is what's happening. We don't take it personally. We don't believe it. We don't engage with it as truth. Mm-hmm. Otherwise. He's, he's trying to control me. That's it. You feel it. He's trying to control me. It's truth. It's absolute truth. Right. And then you live out of that. You push away. Whole worlds are created out of that belief. He's trying to control me. Right. You turn on that light of the witnessing observer. Oh, he wants to be with me. He bridges my splits. I feel trapped by that. He feels soothed by that. Okay. So what do we do now? What's the next step? You know, the, but the light, when you see it, the light you can't believe it it's like i love that story of the snake and the rope once you see it's a rope you can't make it a snake you mm-hmm. can't blame him right. anymore it's not possible right. yeah right. it's just not possible so that witnessing observer is the medicine really to shift the seeing and the understanding and to yeah. bring light and I don't remember if this was um, the way you phrased it or, or, but the way I've always learned to do that is to, when I feel something is I will start with, isn't that interesting? Because interesting is so, um, like, it's kind of a neutral observation. <laughs> like it's, it requires some notice. <laughs> um, and so then like, especially with, I have the 3955, which your wife has, and I'm, um, So I'm sure you're familiar with the melancholy and the, and I will just be in, I'll just like, oh, like wake up. And I'm like, don't talk to me. And I, a lot of times blame it on my coffee. I haven't had coffee. And other times I cannot have coffee. She does the exact same thing. I got to have my coffee. (laughs) Don't talk to me. Why are you talking to me? Do you not see that I'm pouring coffee now? I haven't made coffee, put coffee in me. And I put it on my, on that, but it is um, really just more about my wave and where I'm at at that moment. Right. And yeah, there's a certain amount I got to wake up for two minutes, but that's, but I really, you know, my second line wants to be alone. I don't want to be whatever. And, um, and I'll catch myself. Well, now when I'm in this thing, when I, where I'm in my wave and it's not just for that second, or if I find myself just being um, really snippy, you know, and then I'll be like, isn't that interesting? Last night we were walking and I noticed myself, we were walking through the neighborhood and I noticed myself saying I don't know why they painted their door that color I don't really like the way it looks and then I would be like you know they need to prune up the bottom of that tree and then I and all of a sudden I stopped and I went to myself I was like isn't that interesting that I'm super critical right now like and then I was talking to my sister about something and I found myself saying some things in a little bit more they were kind of observations, but they were very judgy. And I was like, isn't that interesting? I wonder what this is supposed to be bringing to my, you know? And so instead of beating myself up, because there's a part of me that really doesn't want to be judgy, right? Yeah. Um, I was like, hmm, I went and looked at the transit. <laughs> so I'm like, what's going on? I couldn't figure it out, but it was it was still interesting to me. So that that witnessing observer really helps me to be more gentle with myself. So I thank you for that idea. It's helped me a lot. So the other well, idea, I, oh, hang on. let me just respond to that. So again, I just look at your chart while you're talking and I think, oh, so I wouldn't go to, isn't that interesting? I, I love that. But I, you're in the field of curiosity with that, right? You open the door of curiosity from judgment to curiosity. That's the shift we're looking at. 
Right. But for you in particular, I think, and I, I try this on and see how it sits with you. I see, oh, you have Pluto in 64, conscious mm -hmm. and unconscious. So that's like the transformation key for you. So interesting. I I think 64 is really interested. It's looking right. at right it's like what's interesting here what's let's let's sort through this whole thing and see what what is let's make sense of this whole this whole the whole caboodle so huh. it fits for me that that 64 would be a key to activate for you to shift out of out of judgment into transformation yeah well that's that's interesting <laughs> so for other people they might be a different question that the witnessing yeah. observer asks more readily yeah exactly so, wow Okay, that's that's a really cool perspective. So, what does your witnessing observer do? You know, I, I haven't looked at it in term in in those terms before. It just came up with you right now. Um, I get just super curious. Uh, so, my uh, we'll we'll play with this for a second. So, my Pluto is in twenty nine and fifty nine. Okay, so I do. Um, I am like a dog with a bone. I do just stick with things. Well, let me stick with this. Let me stick with this. Let me stick with this. Let me, let's stick with this and see um, what we get. I don't give up easily. So I think my witnessing observer stays in, like stick with it, stick with it, stick with it and penetrate, 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 stick with it. Something like that. What do you, how do you interpret the 59 two in that? Cause that's my design son. And I, um, the, the thing that stood out the most, whenever anybody just was talking about the 59 two was they referred to it as self-imposed barriers to intimacy. Hmm. Interesting. I think of the 59 for myself again, in Pluto, Pluto in the 59 is that, I think of the 59 um, like sperm. Okay. It's wanting to penetrate. It's wanting to break through, whether it has a six or not, it's wanting to break through to something. And for me, the two part of that is like in my own world, doing it in my own world. In okay. my, like I'm an artist. I don't do enough art or writing. Like when I, when I, Transformation happens when I sit down, persevere, and penetrate. Like let the let let things come through. Let that energy, that sacral energy, have some life, like an emotional life, because it's going towards emotional solar plexus, right? So there's an emotional, like okay, we can do this. Let's figure this out. Let's just let's stick in there. There's a real stick to itness that. I think, uh, and again, I've got the sun in gate three. So I, the more I stay with something, the more it illuminates. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So um, there were a couple things I wanted to um, go to from there, um, but I keep in my mind hearing um, the word that I can't say. Entelechy, is that how you say it? Entelechy, yeah. Okay. It's something you use this expression in a lot of your books. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it's a great concept. And I, can you just speak to it a little bit and how you see it in human design? Yeah. So IntelliKey is basically your innate potential. So an, uh, an oak tree, like a, a an oak. Um, acorn. Acorn. There you go. An acorn. I, and I knew it was in there somewhere. <laughs> an acorn has <clears throat> IntelliKey to become an oak tree. It's not going to become something else. Will it will it live to its full potential? Will it have the right circumstances and environment to do that? I don't know, but it has that potential. Our body graph holds a certain we're, we're like our our each unique acorn or lotus mm -hmm. seed or whatever that would be. We hold a certain potential. Our conditioning can work to support us to realize that potential if we bring that light of awareness in right it can be grist for the mill it can be in tibetan buddhism they call it fuel for the path so not to go black and white oh this is bad this is this is good but what is our potential and are we living it 
What is our dharma? Are we living it? And the body graph holds our potential, is the seed of our potential. Are we aligning with it? Or are we staying stuck in conditioned ways that are limiting us and keeping us from, you know, I mean, you know, Oprah talks about, you know, your best live life or something like that. But truly, mm -hmm. you know, when we're living who we're here to be, just like you with your husband, I mean, the whole world changes when right. we start to align. Everything matches the frequency. It's a frequency world. We're in a frequency universe. We align with ourselves and the universe comes to meet that. This is also Byron Katie's work, you know. <laughs> The internal, the external comes to meet the internal. Right. So if we are out of alignment, if we're not living our entelechy, the world is going to reflect that back to us. Yeah, and so many people I see now and um, using human design against themselves, right? Where, well, you know, I have a, I'm a projector. I can't do anything. I have to just sit here. I can't talk to somebody until they talk to me. I can't, you know, or I'm, um, I have an open emotional solar plexus. So I'm not, you know, those aren't my feelings. I'm not, you know, and those people with emotions are some, you know, they're pushing them away. Like there's some sort of, you know, problem. So how, um, How do you see like this future of human design, like now that there's so many people talking about it? Um, yeah, I love this question, actually. And I, I write about it in this last book on human right. design and essential oils that, you know, human design, the way I see human design is that it's what I call a terma in, in Tibetan Buddhism. There are these teachings that are, that are hidden in different you know, in the waters, in the rocks, they're hidden in people's minds and that the right time they're revealed to humanity. Mm -hmm. So I feel like this was a term that was revealed to humanity at this time for us, for this time. With human design came a huge wave of like, oh my gosh, I'm okay. I'm good. I'm, I don't have to make myself wrong. And then the backlash or then the the um, making it um, uh, like mainstream almost like, you know, people started using it against themselves. Like you, just like you're saying, I'm a projector, you know, and oh no, not, not understanding. And really the, the, the multidimensional capacity and aspect of, of the chart, it's a living transmission. It's not a flatsy thing it's not Im logical information but we've kind of the, the challenge is to not have it just go to a party game oh yeah i'm this you're this i mean that's fun that's great we can have it be fun but you think about the tarot or you think about um you know cards and if you go back it's very esoteric this is this is esoteric stuff you guys this yeah. is really deep stuff this is yeah. deep. It's kind of like when people think they're not into astrology because all they or they're into astrology because they read the Sunday horoscope that's like this long for their sun sign, right? Exactly. Um, yeah, you you can't do it on a surface level and have it have any kind of impact. And um, so many people will are afraid or they're not ready, you know. So um, you know they're not ready to go deep yet because they're still in the fear. You know, they haven't done what it takes to. And so what do you tell those people? Well, let me back up a little bit. I think it's inevitable. What's happening with human design is inevitable. It's the backlash to it, or it's the next evolution of it. So I think um, it's going to go, it's going to, it's like wildfire and it's going to become, vernac you know, it's going to be part of the conversation. And it's, it was on the Washington Post, you know, what's in for, 2023 right what's in right. human design so that's fantastic right oh, the seeds are being right. planted i think for myself um 
I can't go to a place of judgment for that, even though it's not, I know, I know what human design and I know what it can do and, and what it is. And it's always unfolding for me. It's a living unfolding thing. I also know when I had my session learning, my wife was a projector, I'm a generator and I'm emotional, changed everything. So those little things can be life-changing. Getting it at that level also can have that effect. The concern is people misunderstanding, putting, putting human design into their system that they already have running of hierarchy. Right. Not understanding that this is about seeing and valuing differences, opening to differences. They go back into the old pattern of, you're a manifesting generator. Oh my God, you're so lucky. You know, or I'm just a generator. You know, like right. it's easy to do. That's easy to do, but we have to stay awake. We have to, all of us, I think, who are, are teaching and giving sessions have to stay awake ourselves to what this, the, the multidimensional aspect of human design and not go into that flat C left brain download informational piece. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. That's very good. So, um, okay. I know we have a bunch of people watching and we've only got about 13 minutes left. Um, well, I should say we have at least a few people watching. Um, and I'm just encouraging people, if you have questions specifically for Robin, um, to put them in the comments so I can read them to her. But, um, so far we've just had people saying hello and they're watching. So, um, the other thing that I, there was something else that I wanted to address with you and now it just went like this. So, um, is there something you would like to talk about that we haven't talked about? Uh, let's see. Well, my big exciting thing right now is my book, my latest book on human design okay. and essential oils. And, you know, I've got all these essential oils here, human design, essential oils. Um, <laughs> I, I like to keep my gates, you know, my gate oils right here, my sun and my earth oils, my incarnation cross. So I've entered part of my evolutionary process is entering another dimension of working with the chart through the essential oils and yeah. bypassing again, looking, how do we bypass the logical left brain patterning to access some of the earlier um, constrictions and systems that are running automatically at this point. So I have really found the, the human design oils like crazy, crazy fun, crazy. Um, yeah, it's my new frontier with people. It's using the oils. I just read um, the book just in the last couple of days and I, you know, I have it on Kindle. And so I've highlighted all these things and I love that it'll save those highlights and stuff for me. Um, and it really spoke to me. And it's funny because when you were talking about your wife, Yarrow, I was like, wait a minute, she's a projector. And the one oil that you recommend for projectors is yarrow. And I'm like, did you make that up for her? But I, I didn't. Know that you're not the one who picked them. It was Greg who- Greg, right. The oils, and that's kind of funny. Yeah. Kind and of funny. another great oil for projectors or for anybody, but projectors or people who are really open is Rue, R-U-E. Because anytime you're with someone and you're taking on all their stuff and you- leave and you're like oh you feel like you've been slimed or something you smell rue and it just it separates out the energies it separates oh, cool. out yeah so i i yeah yarrow's been using rue quite a bit <laughs> yeah um so i don't have that i don't have either of those two what i found is i'm going to need to order some of your blends and i'm very excited to do so i just have to decide which ones i make sense to do first um but you do have other you even if someone doesn't have essential oils when they get the book, you have other protocols you can do in there that were really interesting. And the the way you just speak about the different centers, um, it's just, it's a really, and, and the types and knowing whether you're aligned or misaligned. And I love how you um, talk about when you're misaligned to be like, yay, now I know to do this work, right? So- mm -hmm. 
instead no, of we feeling- never want to we never want to beat ourselves up for where we are or what what our chart is or how we are in relationship to it we never it's it's not kind where human design is kindness itself it's ultimate kindness yes it's ultimate compassion yes awesome that's um really good so so far um Let's see, what essential oils would you recommend for generators? Lisa asks. Yeah. I know it's in the book, but if you could maybe just mention a couple or. Yeah. So um, if you're working with your strategy, Lang Lang, Y-L-A-N-G, Y-L-A-N-G is a good oil to work with your generator strategy to work with the generator um, Lynn, so these are, I, I will put them in your, on your Facebook page, the, um, the links to order these at Greg's site, Great. but um, for generators, um, frankincense is a great oil to okay. align with your type. Uh, manifesting generators, I'll just say this since there might be others, lemon verbena or lemongrass. Again, Greg has, um, blends that are going to be, a, you know, I think the blends are more potent than the single oil, but start with a single oil for sure. Um, projectors, yarrow, manifestors, sitka or cystus and reflectors, red pine. And is if someone is not able to right now get them from Greg, is there anything you recommend when someone's choosing an oil? As far as knowing the quality is right, like, is there any I, I, I would recommend getting him for, for me, I get all my oils from Greg just yeah. because he's a small independent. He makes sure all the oils are pure. He may, you know, he's like researching all the oils and where they're coming from. You, you can, you can buy them in a store, but there are a lot of them are um, synthetic, synthetic. Yeah. 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 Okay. And, and what yeah. we're doing is we're smelling, we're bringing in the plant essence, it's going past the blood brain barrier. So you want pure oils. Let's just say you, you want, you're bringing it into your bloodstream. You're it's actually one of the most potent ways to bring and smell and scent also, you know, like so potent to bring energy frequency into your system. Well, I have to say every book that I have read, I've thought, wow, this is so good. And then every time, whatever the next book is that you write, I think, oh my God. Right. And I loved, loved your book on the profile line. So it's definitely my favorite source for in-depth. You know, I love the way you, I feel like you're the only one who really in-depth talks about the entelechy of the combined profile lines, like what it means to be not just what it means to be a six line and a second line, but what it means to be a six two. You know, you really speak to that in ways that um, I don't think is readily available in other books. And um, I loved your book on the centers. I am, I'm always, you know, very aware of my open Ajna and open head and my tendency to think there's something wrong with me. Um, and sensitivity to do, you know, like even when I'm, when I read your book and all these great things I read in this last book, but are, can I pull them out right now? <laughs> that, that's why I love the Kindle and I can highlight them and then I can find them in there and I can send them to people or whatever later when I'm, I'm like, I know there was something I wanted to tell you, but I don't know what, um, but you speak to that so beautifully in the center's book that I was really surprised at how much I got from you speaking about those centers again in reference to working with the oil. So I think you're um, right because there within the oil book, I really do talk about that continuum of, are we aligned with our generator self? Are we unaligned? Are we aligned with our open head? Are we unaligned? Are we, what well, let's look, let's bring curiosity, right? Let's look and right. see. And how do we get aligned? Yeah. So before we end this, I would just like to um, ask, because we do have a real mixture of people in this in group that this is recorded in, um, and it, I do put these up on YouTube um, tomorrow. I usually do it at midnight, they go live. But 
most of the people watching it now, well, at least anyone watching it today is in the group. And there's some of them are very new in their journey. So, um, you know, and they, it's fair. I can think of a few people who their questions get very up in their head and they get very, am I doing this right? Am I, what is, you know, what am I supposed to do next kind of thing? And I'm just wondering if you have any, I didn't prep you for this. So hopefully your okay. Asha is going to find something for the newbies of what you would. Um... Well, I mean, depending on how, I, I really think that my first book, Understanding Your Clients Through Human Design is one of the easier books to enter into the types with, you know, I, I try to make it really like, oh, generators are like working dogs and projectors are like cats. I, I try to make it, oh, these are the strengths. These are the vulnerabilities. Um, I think that's a great place to start right there. I think the biggest thing is to trust yourself and, and let yourself remember you're in relationship to the triangle. You're in relationship to your body graph. You have your own journey. It's like a kid learning to talk or a kid learning to read. Each person is different. Our, our tendency is to be in this pol polarized polarity world, right, wrong, good, bad. Am I getting it? Am I not getting it? So the invitation is to shift your assemblage point to bring your curiosity. How do I learn it? What's my best way of entering into these waters and being in relationship to yourself with it and with the chart and, and having an intention of aligning with yourself? Yeah. Well, that's, um, yeah, that's really great advice. And I did post the links to the two in, in the book I was just reading, you had links to free versions of both of your first two books, including the one you just mentioned. And so those are in separate posts in the group. So if anybody's interested and hasn't downloaded those yet, you can find those in the group. And um, I want to thank you so much for um, taking this time. I really, really have enjoyed it. And I could talk to you, um, especially about all, I could really geek out on talking about the assemblage point and all the um, <laughs> other things. Although I know my friend Nancy is listening and she doesn't like when I say geek out because she thinks I, that's something derogatory. To me, it's not derogatory. So Nancy, I don't mean any offense. <laughs> um, but I want to thank you for joining us. And um, just to let people know that you know, this, we're talking about human design stories of how human design has helped people to tell a better story of who they are and their journey. And so if you're not aware of how you can shift your journey with human design, you know, if you're re ready to rewrite your story, you can reach out to me, or um, I know you can reach out to Robin and Robin um, will put your contact info in here, but is there a specific way that people um, uh, you can write me at Robin at clients and human design.com. Okay. Uh, that's a great way. I have a, a website on its way, <laughs> hey. uh, but yeah, it's been a, my pleasure. Kathy, I love what you're doing and shifting our stories through human design is, it's really shifting our lives really. And shifting the, the world we live in. When we shift right. our story, we shift the world we live in. So very powerful work. Thank you.